everyone, and welcome back to the Ultimate Persona Compendium. We're at the final part of this Persona 1 analysis, and it's been quite a journey. We started at the very beginnings of the Mega Ten franchise, and worked our way up to its first exposure to the West, with the PlayStation 1 game Revelations Persona in 1996. As I mentioned in the last part, this would later be re-released for the PlayStation Portable in 2009. We've already explored much of its story and gameplay in detail. However, the PSP version is quite a different beast. It feels less like a standard port at times, and more like a different game entirely. And this owes to many different factors that we'll get into in this part. For now, let's go back to something I mentioned back in part 1. The localization efforts made by Atlas USA to broaden the game's appeal. It's time we explored this localization a little deeper. It's time we danced crazy. He said it! The year is 2009. Shin Megami Tensei and, to a great extent, Persona are now well-established names in the Western world. Not necessarily mainstream successes, but successes within the niche world of JRPGs. Atlas USA didn't get this success by deceiving gamers of their origins. They got there by fully embracing it, and giving their fans exactly what they wanted, what they had been asking for. Faithful localizations. We're now long past those early days. The mentality that gave birth to the localization of Persona 1 is now long dead. The Atlas USA of 2009 was a vastly different entity. However, this also held true for its Japanese branch. In 2003, Kozi Okada, one of the six founding members of Atlas and the director of the first Persona game, departed the company to start his own. Some years after this, Kazuma Kaneko, the artist on almost every Atlas title since the late 80s, would take a back seat to newer talent. This signalled the end of an era. The classic Atlas team that produced the original Persona trilogy was no longer the same. A new Atlas would rise, and with it, a new flavour of Persona. Persona 3 and 4 would have many departures from the series' older format. Obviously, I'll be talking more about this when we get to those games. At the moment, it's relevant to mention just one of these departures, because it would play a huge role in how Persona 1 would be re-released in 2009. I am, of course, talking about their soundtracks. <laughs> However, I'm getting ahead of myself. For now, let's return to that classic era. Back to the original PlayStation 1 game. Only this time, not from the mindset of someone in 1996. Instead, we'll be looking at it with the benefit of hindsight. The perspective of someone in 2018, who has played both versions and done entirely too much research on this single game. Are you still talking about Persona 1? That game is super old! The original localization is reviled by fans, and is often cited as an example of how not to localize a game. Let's start by taking a look at the cast. Most of them have received name changes to better suit the illusion that this is meant to be taking place in America. K. Nanjo becomes Nate Trinity. Maki becomes Mary. Reiji becomes Chris, Hideohiko becomes Brad, and for some reason Ellie becomes Ellen, even though it's already a western name, and Yukino becomes simply Yuki. Most of the characters lose their surnames altogether, including the protagonist. The Japanese version allowed you to choose a first name, a second name, and a nickname for him. In the US version, you're only able to pick a single name. Of course, the name changes don't end there. 
Most of them are fairly mundane and easy to wrap your head around. The fat kid Toro is renamed to Chunky. Tamaki is renamed to Tami. Tsutomu is renamed Kane. Setsuko is renamed Nancy and so on. Then we have the stranger ones. The ones that seem to be blatant Batman references. The couple, Yosuke and Chisato, are renamed Bruce and Selina, respectively. I suppose that could be a coincidence on its own. But then we have Yamaoka, Kei's loyal butler, who was renamed to the rather obvious Alfred. This choice actually isn't that far from the original intent, though. In an interview, Kaneko himself compared Yamaoka to Alfred from Batman. It's unclear whether Atlas USA knew this and changed his name accordingly, or they just noticed the similarity themselves. Whatever the reason, the USA staff must have had a lot of love for the 89 Batman movie, because we also have this line from the boss, Salva. Tell me something, my friend. You ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? And then we have Takahisa Kandori, who was renamed to Guido Sardinia, which is a much harder name to take seriously, especially when he's going around and calling himself Super Guido. I've been using these English names throughout the previous two parts, but from now on we'll be using the Japanese names, since they were retained in the PSP version. Confusingly, it wasn't just their names that were changed. They felt the need to alter some of the character designs as well. Some characters have seemingly random hair colour changes and lighter skin tones. Unnatural looking lighter skin tones. The protagonist himself had a massive redesign with a completely different face. His sprites now have red hair instead of blue. It's unclear what exactly these changes were meant to convey. The obvious answer is that it was to make the characters look more white, but many of these changes don't even do that. Maki's hair was changed from brown to a brighter, more reddish brown? Why? Why go through so much effort for cosmetic changes that do nothing but mess with the original art? And they couldn't even be bothered to change these designs in the opening FMV, either. The protagonist is clearly a different guy here, and Maki's hair looks normal again. Perhaps the most infamous character design change is Mark, who definitely did have a change of race. He's black in this version. We gotta appeal more to that urban demographic, you know? This is a change that ties into another problem with this localization. It's awkward bits of unintentional racism. Early on, Yukino, Ellie and the main character are trying to get into the school with an injured Setsuko. They need to give a password to prove they're not demons. How this localization is handled between the PS1 and PSP versions is very telling. In the PS1 version, Ellie gives the following password. Roses are red, zombies are blue, but my face is white, so you know I'm true. Now, we all know the actual meaning of this little rhyme, so let's not jump the gun. She's saying she's human because zombies have a radically different complexion due to them being, you know, dead. However, the implications here just make it unintentionally hilarious. How was Mark meant to get into the school with that password? You could just imagine how awkward it would be for everyone involved. So how did the PSP version handle this? Well, it's fairly similar, with one key difference. Roses are red, zombies are blue, I don't want brains so you know I'm true. Technically, I think the PS1 translation is better since it has two contrasting references to skin colour, while the PSP translation just abandons it. It's ultimately the better version though, because it avoids race altogether. The funniest thing about the awkwardness in the PS1 version is that it was brought about by their own decision to make Mark black. And this isn't even the only place they do this. Shortly after this scene, Mark and Brown are thrown in jail. Which is already pretty funny on its own, if you think about it. But then Kay remarks that they look like some caged up monkeys. Oh my god, just stop Revelations Persona, stop! 
You're making localization fumbles so epic that we're still talking about them 20 years later. And don't get me started on the amount of times K curses that damn Guido. I tried my best to put myself into the shoes of those Night Is Atlas localizers to try and understand what went wrong. Since no interviews with its staff exists, and believe me, I've gone looking for them, all we can do is speculate based on what we see in the final product. Back in part one of this series, I mentioned that the US localization team was made up of only six people. Let's compare this to the localization team found in the credits of Persona 2 Eternal Punishment, an Atlas USA title that had a noticeably higher quality localization job, despite it still retaining some of the altered names from the previous game. This game had an international coordinator, a marketing manager, a technical coordinator, five translators, someone editing all of those translations, and finally, and this one might be the most telling of all, free people on quality assurance. So in total, we have 12 people working together to ensure a high quality localization. That's twice as many people as the team behind Revelations Persona. But let's not stick to just one example. We also have the PSP release to work with. While the amount of staff working on this translation was more or less the same as the original game, you'll notice that they have many names in, once again, the Quality Assurance Department. So I think we can conclude that Revelations Persona was understaffed, and simply didn't have enough people overseeing the localization. But hey, you don't have to read the credits to figure that one out. This game is riddled with spelling and grammar errors. No, you're stupid! You are story sounds fake. The demon talked to you. No talk to balls. And then we have some really weird item names like Resolver, which I think was meant to be Revolver? Kepler Vest, which was obviously meant to be Kevlar Vest. The series trademark line I am thou, thou art I, is rendered as I'm you, you're me which doesn't quite sound as mystical. They don't even leave out the contractions for emphasis. One of the more infamous lines is, Mark danced crazy. Which is so beloved, it's the only part of the old translation that was kept for the PSP version. You might say that this is a black mark on the localization. All the stuff we've looked at so far, while very amusing, isn't anything that ruins the game. The translation is mostly accurate to the source material. It even reads better than the PSP translation in some lines. For example, in the opening scene, Mark says, You guys suck as usual, which is snarky and sounds like something a teenager would say. PSP has him saying, You guys are so cold, which isn't quite as good. However, this is the exception and not the rule. The PSP version has the superior translation by Miles. To illustrate this, I'll give a direct comparison between both translations of this pivotal scene, where the ideal Maki is confronting the real Maki. For example, let's take this first line. I found it! I found my true self! Aha! Found you, real me! The PSP version has made this sound more in character for Maki, Let's leave this talk of true selves to characters like Philemon. Maki is just a confused girl in high school. Real me sounds more believable. Wait a minute! Where do you plan to run to? There's no more places to run! Hold it right there! Where do you think you're running off to? There's nowhere left to hide! The problem with the PS1 translation here is that there's too much repetition, and the phrasing is bad. Both of these sentences end with the word run, which makes it sound clunky, and where do you plan to run to doesn't sound quite right. Where do you think you're running off to sounds far better. Next we have this line. People's consciousness are just bubbles from the sea. Which just sounds weird. 
The PSP version makes sure to specify that these bubbles are from this sea, as in the place we are right now, the collective unconscious, and not the Atlantic Ocean or something. The very next line is Maki saying, I was not supposed to be born, which feels unrelated to what she said a moment ago about the collective unconscious. The PSP version fixes this, and makes the line feel like a continuation of the previous one. Now, here is my least favourite set of translated lines in all of the PS1 game. This line requires quite a bit of context. I don't want to hear any more words come from you! Did you try to change things? What things have you done? Or did you just cry in bed? I want to trade places with you. Mark, Nate, Ellen, and main character. In watching all of you, wouldn't you? What am I even reading? Exactly my thought, Sachi. This last part had me staring at the screen in confusion for about 10 minutes. It's like I'm a game journalist trying to play through Persona 5. What does it all mean? So I think what she's saying here is that she wants to trade places with the real Maki, so she can watch over all of her friends like the real Maki has been doing. Not sure why she would want to do that when she's currently in a much more proactive position than the Maki she's talking to. And this is the part that gets me. She asks the real Maki if she would also want to do this. But she's already doing it, Maki. She's already in that position that you're saying you want to be in. So how does the PSP version handle this? But now's our chance! We can change along with Masao, K, Reiji, and main character! The meaning here is incredibly clear. She's saying she wants them both to change along with everyone else, which is referring to the individuation process I mentioned back in part one. Most of these lines read a lot more clunky than the PSP translation, but at least you can still extract the same meaning from them. This line is incomprehensible, even if you know what it's meant to be saying. I couldn't tell you what went wrong here, but it's easily the lowest point of the translation. Spelling and grammar aren't the only places this translation falls short on. An important aspect of the Megami Tensei games has always been its mythological references. We examined this quite closely in part one. Unfortunately, a lot of these references are lost in this early translation, for a variety of reasons. These reasons range from incompetence to intentional changes, basically dumbing the story down to broaden its appeal. You can see this with its attempt at changing its setting to an American town instead of a Japanese one, despite there being a Shinto shrine you visit quite often. America is known for its large quantity of Shinto shrines. Also, as a side note, you can see that some of the in-game Japanese text was replaced with English text. This was undoubtedly intentional. Whereas the bad translations we looked at earlier were just incompetence. However, the thing about this translation is that the line between intentional changes and incompetence isn't always clear. You can see this when we examine how this translation handles mythological references. Let's start with this scene where you examine the stone in the school's courtyard. This stone was said to have been dropped from the sky by a heavenly being called Hiriman, which is a figure from Hindu mythology. The PSP version correctly calls it the Hiriman Stone. However, the PS1 version incorrectly calls it the Philemon Stone. This was an incredibly easy mistake to make given that the katakana for Hirimon and Philemon is identical. Since Philemon is a prominent figure in Persona, it makes sense that they would assume it was him and not Hirimon, especially since Hirimon isn't even mentioned anywhere else in the game. This is a forgivable mistake, but it's one that illustrates the difference in research between both versions. There are many more mistakes like this that are far less forgivable, such as the demon and persona names, which are also derived from mythology. As I've already mentioned, it's hard to tell which names were changed because the localization team thought it sounded cooler, 
versus what they were simply unable to translate. For example, Quetzalcoatl, the Aztec god, becomes Hive, and thus it has lost all of its mythological ties and simply becomes just some demon. This is also what happened to all of the HP Lovecraft references for whatever reason. Yog Sothoth Jr. becomes Yoga Jr., and everyone's favourite antagonist, Nyalafotep, becomes Massacre. They didn't even manage to catch the obvious Shakespeare references with Oberon and Titania, who become Kingfly and Queenfly, respectively. Some of the new names seem to come directly from their character designs which suggests they didn't know how to properly translate it. Vidofnir becomes gaseous, probably because it looks like a cloud of gas. Kukalin becomes Lance, because he has a Lance. Phalag becomes Halo, because he has a Halo. Barbatos becomes Jester, because he kind of resembles one, and so on. Yaxini somehow becomes Valkyrie, I think they were trying to be a little clever with this one, but all they really managed to do was show their lack of research. Yaksini is from Hindu mythology, whereas Valkyries are from Norse mythology, and look nothing like this. Not even close. In fact, Valkyrie had already appeared in other Megami Tensei games, and looked how you would expect. And then we have the ones that looked like they were trying to stay close to the original name, but mistranslated it anyway. Kali becomes Kari, with an R. Anubis becomes Anuvis. Azriel becomes Azreel. Beelzebub becomes Beaslybum. Cerberus becomes Cerebus. How do you mess up Cerberus? And lastly, we have my favourite one. Mainly because you can tell exactly where they went wrong. The Persona Almighty becomes Almighty. Almighty is a figure from Zoroastrianism. They didn't know this though, so they just assumed it was an English word and translated it back into the English alphabet. But they didn't even do that right. They translated it to Almighty with two L's. The Revelations Persona translation is now starting to look like a parody of itself. So let's move on from the translation and look at another area of the game that was heavily altered. The game mechanics and its content. Many sources claim that Revelation's Persona has a significant drop in difficulty compared to its Japanese release. This is because its encounter rate was dropped meaning there would be less battles between point A and point B than there would be ordinarily. I've never seen any sources that detail how much its encounter rate was dropped though, so I decided to do a little experiment. From the hub world, I walked around and counted the amount of steps before an encounter was triggered. I did this 12 times while playing both versions of the game, and these were the results. While playing the Japanese version, the least amount of steps I took before an enemy encounter was 16, while the highest was 67. If we calculate the median, we get an average encounter rate of 22.5 steps. So what is it in the US version? The least amount of steps was 32, and the highest was 97. There's over a third less enemy encounters over the course of the entire game. This change meant that they also had to adjust the amount of XP you earn from each battle as well. If they didn't, you'd quickly become underleveled and the game would become much harder, which is the opposite of what they intended. After finishing my little test, I made sure to check everyone's levels. Even though the same amount of battles was fought in both versions, the characters in the US version are much higher level. So this is what we have in the US version. Less battles, but greater hauls of XP. Strangely, they didn't increase the amount of money you earned along with it. In the original game, the currency was Yen, which was naturally changed to dollars in the US release. The only difference between these two numbers is that the latter has two less zeros. 
Now the cheapest item in the store is a single dollar instead of 100 yen. Since a single dollar is the lowest you can find in this version, the enemies that dropped less than that have been changed slightly. For example, three Prita Demons dropped 30 yen in the Japanese version. Here they drop three dollars, which is a lot more. Apart from this minor detail I noticed, you earn the same amount of money in both versions. Since the US version has less battles, you'll end up with less cash than you would ordinarily, however. The next thing is a very minor change, but it's worth mentioning anyway. In the US version, a loading screen graphic was added that features Vishnu. Guess who? Vishnu! And welcome back to Persona 1! Lastly, we have the biggest change from the Japanese version. The removal of the Snow Queen quest, which was a significant portion of the original game. It was intended as a sort of bonus campaign for those who had already finished the main Seabeck route. In the original Japanese release, after getting back to the school, you're given the choice of which route you want to do. The Seabeck route or the Snow Queen route. The Seabeck route is continued when you decide to leave through the hole at the back of the school. Getting to the Snow Queen route is a bit more esoteric, and requires jumping through some hoops first. Firstly, you have to speak to this girl that tells you about Tsutomu in the library. He'll ask if you've heard of the cursed Snow Queen play at the school. You can then ask the drama club about it, followed by the student council president, and then the principal. From this point on, you can enter the gym's storage room and find the Snow Queen mask. If you decide to take it from its box, the Snow Queen quest will be locked in and you'll no longer be able to do the Seabeck route. However, this is only in the Japanese version. If you try these steps in the US version, you'll fall at the first hurdle. Tsutomu won't mention anything about the Snow Queen play, and neither will anyone else. You can still enter the gym's storage and see the box, but the protagonist will immediately leave. Besides this, the only other trace of its existence in this version is an FMV they forgot to remove. If you return to the school sometime after leaving for the Seabeck route, you'll find that it vanished. Or rather, it's floating in the sky with four towers surrounding it. Imagine watching this FMV in the night is and trying to figure out what it meant. This leaves us with a very important question. Why was this second route removed from the US version of the game? This has been a point of speculation for over 20 years, and the truth is, we don't have a concrete answer. Just for the sake of bringing some closure to this, we may as well look at a couple of these theories. One reason might have been that Atlas wanted to get the game out in time for Christmas. The game was released in Japan in September 1996, the US release arrived only two months later in November. That's actually incredibly speedy for Atlas, if we compare it to their release history over the last two decades. Persona 2 Eternal Punishment came just shy of six months after its Japanese release, Persona 4 five months after its Japanese release, and finally the notoriously delayed Persona 5 came seven months after its Japanese release. So how did an early Atlas USA, with significantly less staff as we've already established, manage to release this game only two months after Japan? This lends credence to the Christmas theory. Another theory suggests that they felt the quest was simply too difficult. That's understandable, for reasons that will become apparent when we examine it ourselves later on. It's unclear when they decided to cut it, but there is evidence to suggest that they didn't always plan it that way. The quest is on the disc, but its data has been dummied out. However, you can still access it using a cheat disc, and what you can find is rather interesting. One of Philemon's FMVs have been dubbed into English. This is the world of sleep and dreams, controlled by Huvenoid. Here, people's souls are sealed by Huvenois in the world of dreams. This is where reality ends and dreams begin. 
Will you decide to wake up the people? Or will you confront and defeat Hoovernoids? The Snow Queen quest wouldn't properly be translated for Western players until the PSP version. I think it's about time we shifted our focus a little more to that. We've rambled enough about this radically altered US release. I've covered pretty much everything worth mentioning. However, I'm sure I've missed a few translation blunders and weird changes, so be sure to let me know about them in the comments section. Or just write Mark Danced Crazy like I know all of you are going to do. So long, Black Mark. Your crazy dance will forever remain in our memories. Please insert Disc 2 of the Ultimate Persona Compendium Part 3. If you're watching this in the official playlist, it will begin automatically after this brief intermission. But if it's not out yet, I'm very, very sorry! Watch some of these other videos instead!